So welcome everybody to um, the second in our new series of webinars for educators. And tonight we're going to focus on a topic which has become one of the centerpieces of our professional development here at JWA, which is thinking about how you use historical sources across the Jewish education curriculum so that we, we obviously here at JWA, I'm trained as a historian and we here at the Jewish Women's Archive obviously believe that teaching history is really important and that we have a lot to learn from historical role models and historical case studies. Um, and we also believe very strongly that teaching historical texts um, provide a lot of opportunities for adding richness and complexity and um, provocative questions and opportunities to learn new skills to the to curriculum. Um, but we also are aware of the fact that we all have many things that we need to be teaching and um, and that history isn't always one of them. And so we have been doing a lot of work on thinking about how we can help teachers teach historical sources in other places in their curriculum. So not only in history classes, but how to bring some of the different kinds of texts and a broader understanding of Jewish texts into their teaching and also how to bring some of the um, skills and perspectives of historical thinking into Jewish education more broadly. And so that's what we'll be discussing tonight. Um, so uh, why use historical sources? That is the first question. If you're not teaching history, what is the purpose of using historical sources? What appeal would it have? And some of these things that we're going to talk about, I think, are um, sort of uh, more sort of obvious or superficial, and some are not. But I think that they all, these there are many different kinds of, of cases to be made. So the first is that English sources are accessible in a way that some of the traditional sources that we teach may not be. So we often have teachers say, oh, it's really nice to be able to mix in a text where we don't have to spend a lot of time kind of just parsing out the words and the language or where I don't need to be finding a translation. And that's not to say that English sources um, are, I mean, that that texts in English or historical sources don't necessarily have, have challenging language that might need to be unpacked, but they can just provide a different kind of, um, uh, yeah, a little break for students for whom um, Hebrew or Aramaic can be challenging. I think also it can be very nice to mix in different kinds of sources and to um, kind of expand the kind of text study that we do by bringing in um, historical sources and modern and contemporary sources alongside traditional classical sources. One of the other things that can be nice about historical sources in terms of their accessibility is that they also just come from a wide range of sources. So it means that you can bring in advertisements or articles or letters, things that are going to have different kinds of tones of voices and, and vary those things in, in what you're presenting to students. And that can be a nice kind of break. Um, part of that also is that um, a lot of the kinds of historical sources that we work with are things that students will not have encountered before. So one of the things that we often hear, particularly from supplementary school students, is just that um, you know they feel that there are a lot of topics that are covered every year and that start to feel a little bit stale. And one of the nice things about bringing in historical sources is that they're just different from the things that they've been taught before. So you can connect them to the same topics that you're studying, be it holidays or um, you know, Jewish values or biblical stories, but um, but you can bring in texts that provide a kind of more modern counterpart. So if you're studying the prophets and you're studying Devorah, you might want to bring in the story of a modern Jewish woman judge and some of what she did and think about what it means to be a judge. If you're talking about resistance during the Shoah, you might talk about Jews and civil rights activism. If you're talking about what are the values of the Jewish community and what are Jewish communities priorities in terms of creating community. You know, you can read the, you can look at the halakhic texts that talk about what a community's priorities should be. Um, but you can also read the letter from Rebecca Samuel in the 1790s in rural Virginia, writing home to her parents in Germany about what the community there has Jewishly and what it lacks and what that means for her and what she wishes she could have, what she's longing for in the Jewish community and, and compare that to what 
an assessment of our own community today and what our priorities are. And so it just provides a kind of different angle and a fresh perspective on some of the same topics that we might otherwise be covering. Another nice thing about historical sources is they, and this is related again to the idea of providing different voices or perspectives, but also they can be in different media. So um, as you all know, we're a very text heavy tradition and I certainly love that, but um, we also know that students learn in all different kinds of ways and that um, for some kids, reading a lot of words can be very challenging, whereas hearing something like a piece of music might be more evocative or resonant um, for some, looking at colorful images can, can really awaken them and um, excite them in new ways. And looking at historical sources, you can bring in cartoons and drawings and songs and video and photographs, and um, it can be a nice way of mixing up the kinds of text that you're looking at. And we also know that part of what we're trying to do in Jewish education is um, make a case for relevance for why the things that we're talking about are um, uh, are uh, relevant to kids' lives and should matter to them. And, and when there's a personal connection, when it's more modern, when it, when it resembles their own lives more, sometimes that case is easier to be made, whether it's something that's, you know, from 75 years ago, but is related to an experience that their grandparents shared or whether it's kids their own age in another community today who are involved in some kind of Jewish protest, there are many different ways that they can, um, <coughs> that they're able to relate to these kinds of sources. Um, yeah, Baruch, we see your question. Judith's gonna briefly answer it and we'll come back to that more um, later in the program. Well, well, the, the person I refer to is Rebecca Samuel and we actually have a lesson plan that's built around her letter. And um, when we talk about case studies um, later in this webinar, I will point you to where that is. And finally, um, using historical sources, and this is really one of the major reasons why we are involved in this work, gives us an opportunity to bring in different voices and perspectives that are not otherwise reflected in um, in the Jewish canonical text. So obviously the Jewish Women's Archive, we're interested in um, bringing in women's voices, but we also, that was our starting place, but we've really expanded our work in terms of thinking about inclusion in general um, and thinking about all the different kinds of Jews whose stories are not always heard, whether it's secular Jews or working class Jews or Jews of color um, or just everyday ordinary people who um, have not made it into the stories of the greats um, and what we can learn from those stories. So what one of the things that we can do is really expand the kinds of voices that and, and perspectives that we are able to share and that raises the chances that everyone in the class will feel that there is something for th that they relate to and that they can connect to. I think also part of what we want to look at today, and this will be the next piece of, um, of the webinar, is thinking about some of the skills and approaches that we bring to historical texts. And I really believe that historical texts can certainly be brought along other kinds of Jewish texts and studied in traditional ways, like in Chavruta style. Um, but we, there are also certain kinds of questions that we bring to historical sources that um, really are sort of implicit questions that we may want to ask more explicitly about other kinds of sources as well. So when we look at historical sources, we ask students to observe and to ask questions and draw conclusions and, and ask particular questions of the text, like, you know, who created it and what was, where were they coming from and what was their purpose in creating it and who would have read it at the time or who would have seen it, who was the audience for it. And those kinds of questions, which are very, which are sort of more foregrounded in the study of historical texts are questions that we may want to bring to other kinds of texts too. And once we begin to look at texts in this way and to think about how we analyze um, the kinds of texts we see in our lives around us, it, it makes those critical thinking skills a little bit more ingrained. Um, and in fact, we see often that when students have learned how to read text in that kind of way, um, that they will encounter text within their own lives, whether it's magazine articles or advertisements or movies, and they will begin to unpack them with those same kinds of questions and same kinds of tools. 
Um, and so it really helps kids develop, it helps actually learners of all ages develop some of those impulses towards um, critical analysis. Great. Um, so a few people joined since we started, welcome. Um, I'm gonna unmute you now and pause for a minute just to invite anyone who may have questions to um, speak up or type as some of you have been doing questions into the chat box. Feel free to do that throughout the rest of the webinar. We wanna make sure that we answer all of the questions that you have. And if we don't respond immediately, it, it doesn't necessarily mean we haven't seen you, but we may just be waiting for a break in what we're doing. Um, and then we will address it. So have no fear. Um, so if there are no questions now, does anyone have anything they'd like to ask? Okay, great. So, um, oh, I'm new, learning new ways to use my mouse. So the next thing that we're going to talk a little bit about is we're going to, we're going to talk about some resources that we have both places to find primary documents on jwa.org and also some places to find written resources for integrating those documents as a study of your work. Um, and then we're gonna move on to briefly looking at four case studies using lessons that we have on the site to model how you might use different sources in different ways. Um, so we have many, obviously, digitized copies of historical documents on the site. Um, and there are a few different places. I'm um, just going to ask people who are not muted to look for that green microphone in the control panel and click on it so that um, we don't necessarily hear you as you're moving around. And now I want to give you all a brief tour of um, some places that you can find primary sources on our site. So for any of you who are less familiar with our homepage, this is the jwa.org homepage. Um, and the first place I'm gonna show you is under this tab called exhibits. We have two exhibits, we have several exhibits, but two that I think are gonna be particularly relevant to some of the work that you're doing. The first is the Women of Valor exhibit. And this is a series of 16 biographical exhibits that we have that parallel the poster series that we've done. So some of you may be familiar with the posters and there are 18 posters, 16 of those women are also chronicled here. Um, so if you click on any of these women, you'll find a very extensive biography. Here are all the chapters in Bella Absug's biography. And within each chapter, there are primary sources, as well as some secondary information that um, reads a little bit more like a book or encyclopedia article would read. Um, and so you can choose a woman and then sort of go through her exhibit and find primary sources, photographs, letters, um, pictures of ephemera, things like that. We saw in the first one um, that there are some audio clips here that you could listen to. Um, so you can search that way and, and look through the women who the thematically or through their work relate to some of the things that you're teaching about. You can also come to this lower section on the menu here on the right and click media. And in the media section, you can view all of the pieces of media that we have for that woman. So this is another place where if you know you're looking for something specific, you know you're looking for an audio clip, you know you're looking for a letter, you can come and sort of browse through the different exhibits and see what they have. So here we have a description of whatever the object is, and then also something that says what kind of file it is. So many of these things are JPEGs, but not all of them are specifically pictures like photographs so for instance this is uh, a jpeg image of a, a brochure that was mailed out so there are many different ways that you can look through the biographical information in the women of valor exhibit um, the next exhibit i want to show you is here under exhibits you'll find it it's called the feminism Ex jewish women and the feminist movement um, but it's here listed under feminism. And this is what the opening of the exhibit looks like. This, when was this project done? Um, this project was launched in 2005. So um, this project 
is organized in a couple different ways, chronologically, thematically, or just searching through the collection of objects that we have. And it's based on um, the contributions, both artifacts and written of 75 Jewish women who were involved in either American feminism or Jewish feminism or both. And so through their objects and stories, it tells a larger narrative about Jewish women and the women's movement. So um, there are a few different ways that you can look through the site. Um, I'm just going to go with thematically first. So in the themes, you can sort of use these to browse through the different women that we have featured and the objects that they've contributed. Um, and if you're looking for something specific or you're looking to be inspired, this is a good way to sort of peruse the site or the exhibit. So you can go through, if you hover over the images, it pops up and gives you a name. Um, and when you click on it, there's some more information that goes with that, the object um, and a statement as well. So um, some of them are audio, some of them are visual, some of them are written. Um, there's a real range of different kinds of sources here. And um, because this exhibit was built in 2005, that's a while ago in internet terms. So um, you'll notice that the URL here doesn't change. So when you want to go back, you just use this button in the top right, and it'll take you back to different ways that you can browse the collection. Look through the timeline for a moment. I know a lot of people um, also like to kind of browse through things chronologically. And so here is a way to do that. And we also have things on the timeline that are not artifacts specifically, but each of these images too, when you click on them, will go take you to the page of the woman with her, with her um, statement and bio as well. Um, and the last way to look at this is through the collection. And this is great if you know what kinds of sources you're looking for. So you can browse by person, you can browse by format, um, you can browse by topic and we also have a list of a set list or a list of keywords. So if you enter a keyword and we've used that word to um, organize some of the material, you'll be able to find it that way. Um, the last place that I think if you're hunting for primary sources, a, a really good place to go, actually not the last place. So there's one other place that you can go, which is at the top of every JWA page. Um, most of the JW pages, I should say, not in the feminism exhibit, for example, um, you'll find this search bar. So if you're looking for something specific or you're looking for something general, you can type it into the search bar and it uses Google to find all of those things on the site. Um, so that's perhaps the most obvious way, but because um, it's here at the top, it's easy to miss. So I want to point that out. Um, and then the last place that if you're sort of looking for sources and um, looking to be inspired or find something immediate, you don't have something specific that you're looking for, a great place to go is the Living the Legacy Project. So um, we just launched the labor module of the Living the Legacy Project uh, in the fall. And Living the Legacy is uh, 24 lessons on Jewish involvement in the civil rights and labor movements. Um, we're not going to talk very much about the um, curriculum right now, you can get more information about that on the recording of our first webinar, which was called um, Butchers, Babushkas and Consumer Activism. And we talk a little bit more about living a legacy there, or you can browse through it yourself. Um, but here, if you go in this right hand menu to this uh, link that says all primary sources and click on it, this takes you to all of the primary sources in the, in the project. And there are over 150 sources, um, hundreds of things that you can go through, and there are many ways to search them. So um, one way is that you can use this keyword list that we have created to find things that are related to topics that you're interested in or topics that you're already teaching about. You can also browse by type. So if you know, for instance, that you're looking for letters, you can um, choose that from the drop down menu, pick apply, and then here are all the letters that are in both the civil rights and labor material. Um, and you can also specify that you only want, <laughs> let's see, it might be better. I'll just switch it up a little bit. So um, what do I know is in there? So you can um, also choose 
which module labor civil rights and narrow down your search a little bit that way. Um, so here are newspaper articles that are present in the labor um, curriculum. Oh yeah. So, um, so when you, sorry, I'll just go back and explain that Judith reminded me, I forgot a step. So when you click on the primary source, it takes you to the source. In this case, it's a transcription of a New York times article. Um, and so it gives you the source, it gives you the rights information here. Um, and then it also gives you a link to the lesson where this source was used. So let's say you stumble upon something that really is interesting to you and you're not exactly sure how you might bring it in. You can go to that lesson by clicking on this link and um, find where it is in the lesson, read a little bit more about how we were framing the documents in the lesson and find some discussion questions to go with it. Um, and that can help you figure out how you might adapt it or bring it into your uh, classroom. And in several, there's, as I think I just said, there are 24 lessons in Living the Legacy. They're very detailed and they bring together both um, historical sources and traditional Jewish texts. So if you're looking for ways to merge those things, there's some good models here as well. Um, so now I want to show you, and this is getting to your question, Baruch, about um, other sites that are developed with primary sources and things like that. So we're going to get onto that question now. So starting with what we have, um, if you see this URL is jwa.org slash teach slash working with primary sources. Um, we put together this page as a preliminary sort of how to guide for people who want to bring primary sources in. And we've listed a few other um, websites here at the bottom that we think are have good collections or um, that have strategies for teaching with primary documents. Um, I don't see, I think on another page, maybe if I click on tackling with text, we also, so one place that I don't see listed on here is on one foot, but on one foot is another great resource for um, finding primary documents, especially more traditional texts or variations on um, traditional texts and interpretations of traditional texts. Um, it's a site that was created by AJWS on one, on one foot with a numeral one dot org. Um, and so we have some links to those other resources, the Library of Congress, um, Facing History and Ourselves has some wonderful activities and um, teaching guides. Um, and then we also have a few places where we've linked to some graphic organizers. This primary source analysis tool, which I'll show you in a minute, is from the Library of Congress. We've developed some of our own and then some other resources that we have for um, educators. One about adapting text and this one, which I want to highlight, teaching with primary sources, which is essentially a worksheet that you can download and use um, by yourself, you can use it with your department, you can use it with your co-teacher or for an um, in-school professional development with other teachers in the school or community that you're working in. And this just sort of helps you think about the process of using primary sources and contextualizing them and then finding creative ways to explore them with your students. Um, we also have with our Tversky Award material, a lesson planning uh, guide. So the Natalia Torsky Educator Award is an award that we give each year to an educator who creatively engages students with primary source documents from JWA. Um, and what the prize, the prize is $2,500 for you and $500 for your students. Um, we have started collecting um, lessons already and you, the deadline is May 13th, so you have the rest of the semester to plan um, any lesson that you might want to submit. We do require a 30 to 60 minute video submission along with your lesson plan and uh, some examples of student work. So all of that is explained under the how to apply section, but here um, in the lesson planning tips, we've walked you through the process of planning a lesson and sort of how you might start narrowing down what sources you would use, how you might integrate those sources with 
the curriculum that you are already working with um, or fusing it into other programs that you might be doing. And then some ideas for sort of starting point questions of how, where you can build from um, to get your students to start delving into really exploring these sources. Um, and along the lines of questions, we're going to go back to the PowerPoint briefly. And I just want to show you, this is the um, graphic organizer from the Library of Congress. The URL is here. It's also linked to on our site. Um, and if you go to the Library of Congress website and look under resources for teachers, it's, I think, at the top of what they list there. Um, but this just, I think, lays out very clearly, both for teachers and students, how the, the process that we use for exploring a historical document, whether it's a photograph or something written or cartoon. Um, and there are also some ideas at the bottom for how you might expand once the students have taken some time to analyze and ask some questions about the material, how you might expand on that. And there's a version for students as well that doesn't include all of the questions, but basically has the categories of observe, reflect, and question with room for them to fill that in. Right. And and knowing Jewish educators, I'm sure that some of you are already thinking of ways that you would take this concept and lay it out in a different way. Um, so that being said, we're going to move now on to some case studies, and I'm going to pass the mouse back to Judith. So the first one that I want to show you is from a series of lesson plans that we did called Go and Learn. And we developed this specifically to address this question of how do you take a historical source, a question that came up in evaluating some of our other material, and this was something the educators really said they wanted from us. How do you take a primary source, a historical source, and teach it in different ways in Jewish education, not just in a historical context? And so we actually developed a whole set of lesson plans, all of which take, each of which takes one source and then includes um, sort of background information and then three lesson plans for different ages or settings um, that kind of model how you would use that one source. And so this one um, takes a letter from Henrietta Zold that she wrote in 1916 when her mother died and a family friend, Chaim Peretz, wrote her letter offering to say Kaddish on her behalf. Um, uh, given that her mother had had eight daughters and no sons. And what I love about this letter is, I mean, there are many things that I love about this letter, but I think this is a really great example of a way that you can teach a historical source in, in a setting that you might not otherwise think of it. So Henrietta Zold probably appears in some of the things that, um, I mean, she certainly appears in many places in Jewish education, but basically in the context of the history of Israel or the history of Zionism in terms of her leadership in Hadassah. And here's an opportunity to bring in her story and her person, um, but in a totally different context, in the context of saying Kaddish and what it means to say Kaddish and what Jewish mourning rituals are and what they're for. And um, we took this letter, which has some very beautiful um, pieces in it. So she talks, she's, it's a very gracious letter and she talks about what a beautiful offer it is. And then she explains why she can't accept the offer um, in terms of, and she explains it in the terms of what Kaddish means to her and to the Jewish community. And then also what her mother taught her about um, what it was, what it meant to have eight daughters and no sons. And so she both addresses the meaning of Kaddish and rituals around mourning, and she addresses what it means to honor somebody's memory. and. She's very clear about her perspective, but she also is incredibly um, polite and gracious. She says, after she explains all of this in very clear terms, she says, but beautiful, your offer remains nevertheless. And I repeat, I know full well that it is much more in consonance with the generally accepted Jewish tradition than is my or my family's conception. You understand me, don't you? Um, and we took this letter and we developed three lesson plans around it. One for for kids that really focuses on um, Jewish rituals around mourning, particularly issues of Nihum Avelim, comforting the mourner. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, what are the Jewish rituals around mourning? Um, we also, for family education, created a lesson that's about honoring family memory and what it means to remember somebody and to honor what they were and what they, who they were and what they stood for. And then for adults, we 
look more at the question of um, both Jewish tradition around mourning and what women's experiences have been in different contexts around that. So we took this one letter and used it as a way to address different things. And one of the things that I love when I teach this source that often comes up is people come up with other kinds of ways that this could be taught. And one of the ones that is often suggested um, is that it be used in teaching kids about respectful communication and um, about uh, respectful speech, because nowadays it's very unusual to encounter a letter that is beautiful and very clearly articulated with a strong argument and yet also very respectful and particularly now that we mostly communicate in very informal ways through email and text message and um, many teachers have said to me you know I would love to bring this in just as an example for students about how they might you know models for communication that kind of express various values rather than just kind of shooting stuff out there so um, I think that's a really good example of how you can take a text that might seem like it should be about one thing and actually use it to teach something else that is something that is you know a value or um, a ritual or something that you're covering in your curriculum. Great. Um, don't forget that if you have questions or observations that you'd like to share, you're welcome to um, interject. But if there are no questions, we will just keep moving on. Um, the next piece that I would like to talk to you about is um, holidays. So holidays are a very easy entry point for a lot of educators, especially for people who are working with younger students, students in elementary school and um, the younger middle school grades. They Holidays provide, students are really familiar with them, especially as they get older. They've learned about the holidays several times. And sometimes the exploration of holidays and what they mean and the rituals around them can get a little bit stale. Um, but holidays also provide a lot of thematic parallels um, to stories of history, um, which in a sense, the stories of holidays are stories of history, but I, we're speaking here, of course, about more modern history. Um, and they also have characters in them who are sort of archetypal and echoed again throughout history um, and map on very easily to historical figures or events um, that we have documents, documented rather. Um, so for example, something as simple as a, the theme of liberation, which comes out in many holidays that we celebrate throughout the year, um, could easily be, be connected to talking about um, historical figures who have been leaders or individuals, even if they're not famous, who have led their communities in some way and talking a little bit about uh, what their motivations were and using historical documents like letters and newspaper articles and photographs to explore a little bit about what that experience might have been like for them and what might have been difficult about it and what might have motivated them as they did that work. Um, it's also a way bringing in historical documents can also um, give modern examples and also build a connection between biblical time and now. So um, something else that I've seen a lot of educators do is sort of work from this traditional story to here's a story in history and then to let's look at who some of these leaders um, or examples might be in our community or in in our in current events. Um, so we have an excellent model of this from the Torsky Award winner from last year, Alison Matana, who wrote um, a lesson called Esther's and Vashti's in the labor movement, who will you be? So you can find her lesson um, and read some more information about here, her on our site at jwa.org slash Twersky slash 2012 winner. Um, and I have links to these in the PowerPoint, which we'll upload at, uh, next week with the recording of the webinar. So you don't have to remember all of this now. Um, so, but if you go to Twersky on our site and you click on 2012 winner, you can find her lesson plan here. Um, and you're welcome to download it and use it in your classroom. Um, but I think what's really great is the framework that Allison set up for her students in contextualizing the sources and also really giving her students a chance to be analytical and practice some of those brain muscles, flex some of those brain muscles that they can, um, they can do when they're, sorry, I'm very confused.
they can practice some of those skills uh, independently in the way that she structured it here. So what Allison did is she gave first a s overview of Purim. She spent a lesson talking to her students about the Purim story and about the holiday. Um, and then in a, a second lesson, she started to give them some background information about the American labor movement. And she introduced to them through primary source documents, um, three women activists, Clara Lemlich, Pauline Newman, and Rose Schneiderman. And so she had them reading primary sources. She had them reading some secondary sources. She had them looking at pictures. She had them listening to um, a recording of herself giving a speech that Rose Schneiderman gave. And at each station, the students examined the primary source documents about this one specific woman and then decided whether she was more like Esther or more like Vashti and, and explained to each other and had a discussion about why they thought um, she was similar to either es Esther or Vashti. And what I love about this is that it is doing many things. So students are engaging with the primary source documents, but they're also really thinking about what are the ways of making change in the world. And what her students did is they developed this narrative of, well, Esther is someone who sort of works within the system to make change that she sees as necessary. And Vashti is someone who sort of rejects the system and tries to change it that way. And so with that framework, her students classified Clara Lemlich, Polly Newman, and Rose Schneiderman as change makers in this way. And I think it really added another level of understanding, both about this moment in history, which few children um, study about, and also ab about this story and about the characters of Esther and Vashti and, and the qualities that they embody. Um, it's a nice opportunity to take the story outside of it, outside of the box a little bit and help students see that when we study a story that's related to a holiday, it doesn't exist only in that framework, but that it has enduring lessons and role models that can be applied in other ways. The next case study that we want to look at, I'm going to talk to you about another go and learn. Um, and actually, let me also just take this moment, Baruch, to point out um, this is the list of go of of the go and learn lessons that we have, and you'll see that um, the third one from the bottom is called "Writing Home: A Letter from an Early American Jew," and that is the Rebecca Samuel letter. Um, so you can find it there. But that is not what I'm going to talk about right now. I just wanted to make sure I pointed that I out before I forgot. Um, and if you go under the education tab to go and learn, that's where you would find that. Um, today we're going to talk about something completely different from Rebecca Samuel in 1790. <laughs> we're going to be looking at Phil and Barbie, and this is an example. Um, of a lesson where the primary source that we took is this image of Phil and Barbie. It was an image that was created in 2006 by Jen Taylor Friedman, who was one of the first women to become um, a ritual scribe, a so ferret. Um, and she's very crafty. And so on the side, she also started making a line of Barbie dolls doing um, traditionally male Jewish things. Um, I particularly in this one like the mini Steinsaltz Talmud that she's holding. <laughs> uh, but in, but anyway, this image made its rounds on the internet in 2006. It was quite provocative. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. It sparked a lot of really interesting quest conversations, um, both about femininity and about Barbie and about Jewish practice and about Jewish ritual and its relationship to gender. And we thought this would be a great opportunity to use a popular culture source as a way to open up some of those conversations about ritual garb and gender and body image and Jewish life. So um, we created these three lesson plans here. The one for youth focuses particularly on issues of body image um, and gender roles in Judaism. The family one looks at uh, kind of explores ritual garb in general and then explores questions of what seems, you know, what what seems quote unquote normal, what what it's for, where gender fits into that. It's actually a really great opportunity to, um, it's a, it would be a great lesson to use with bar and bat mitzvah kids if you're doing a lesson that introduce, introduces talit and tefillin and thinking about what are the reasons why um, people wear them and what they're meant to signify and what are some of the issues that come up around that, um, whether girls are gonna wear them or not this can be an interesting way to do it. Um, and then the one for adults looks more specifically at issues 
of gender and Jewish ritual and changes in Jewish ritual. Um, so again, this is just, this is a way to start a conversation from a very different place than where you might otherwise start a lesson that was a teaching kids how to lay to fill in, for example. And it also allows kids to ask questions because it's taking this very provocative image that, um, that doesn't necessarily tell you what it, you know, it, it offers many possible interpretations about what it signifies. You can look at this and say, well, this is insulting because Barbie is insulting, or you can look at it and say, no, this is a different reading of Barbie, or it's a different reading of Tefillin, or, you know, it, it raises, a, there's a lot of possibilities here. Um, it allows students to ask those questions from a kind of different angle that may feel a little bit more open or less, um, less scary. And one of the, let one of the, um, activities that I particularly love it, which this comes from the family education piece, um, is an exercise where a, a whole bunch of statements are read out and you place yourself under a sign that says either agree or disagree or strongly agree or strongly disagree, or it can also be done where you stand on a line as sort of a continuum. Um, and it, there's like 20 different statements. Some of them are things, you know, one is something like, I think Tefillin looks strange on women. And another one is, I think Tefillin looks strange on men and women, because there is something for many people that is just strange about these objects. And so it allows those kinds of things to be unpacked because you're looking at an image that is, is so dissonant. It's something you've never seen before. Um, and, and so that we wanted to bring this in. And a lot of people, when they saw, when we first released this lesson in 2008, people were like, I don't get it. What's the primary source? And we said, well, it's, it's a popular culture source. It's a contemporary source. And those are historical sources too. Um, one of the things I also like to say with this one is that if it's hard for your students to imagine it as a historical source now, um, one of the things you can ask them is, what do you think people 50 years from now will make of this when they look back at it and see this picture? Will they even know what it is? Will they know what Barbie is? Will they know what Tefillin are? Um, how do you imagine the both the American society and the Jewish community being different that may affect how someone would understand or read this image and that could help them have that perspective on it and begin to understand that um, the way that we understand things evolves over time and changes based on context. It's also a great reminder, as Judith said, of all of the primary sources that we may encounter in our personal lives that we don't think of as historical documents. So like things, a blog post, <laughs> like, like a blog post, especially if it's written from the first person or, um, you know, letters and photographs and recipe cards and articles and all sorts of things that we and our students and their families and our community members have accumulated um, that are objects from our lives. All of those things are primary sources too. And um, we, it, it's a great, another great way to bring in primary documents is to sort of reach out to your community and see what is out there around a certain topic or event or idea and, and see what the community has to contribute um, for your students to study and, and gain an, a better understanding of, of themselves and of history through the ephemera of other people's lives. Um, I am conscious we're getting close to time. So we're gonna talk about uh, one more example that we have and then we'll uh, wrap up. So the last example that I wanted to talk about today is um, how we might connect uh, historical documents and historical figures specifically to Jewish values. So Jewish values are on the list, high on the list of things that we teach about as Jewish educators several times. And also one of those things that can sometimes feel a little didactic or a little distant, depending on um, your students' experiences and, and, and how they're entering into a discussion of Jewish values. So, um, but by using the personal experiences of people in historical documents, we can pinpoint how our own identities and values that are important to us inform choices that we make about what we do in the world. Um, so for example, if you read letters about people who have decided to go south uh, during the civil rights movement or diary entries of people who are activists, you can analyze their motivations a little bit and ask students to draw conclusions about um, 
the difficult decisions that they made or the reasons why they've chosen to to be active or not in some cases, and then draw some parallels to their own lives and times when they've made those decisions or or thought about um, taking action in, in their own experiences. Um, historical figures are also great examples of um, different ways that we might take action and can give students sort of open the door of possibility for ways that students could be in the world. Um, so I'm just going to give some examples of that now. And I, I think the best example we have from this in our resources is, is actually on our site for bat mitzvah age girls and their families and teachers. Um, so this is called mybatmitzvahstory.org. It has a different URL from our regular site, jwa.org, but we um, still, this is still part of JWA. Um, and here on this top tab, that's sort of tiny, is the educators and clergy section. And there, there are four um, activity guides. And the guide that I think best exemplifies this idea of, of drawing parallels and looking at the motivation of historical figures to, to teach values is this lesson called Jewish Values in Action. Um, and so what this lesson does is uses historical figures, has the students think about them and then match um, Jewish values that those in this case, women exemplify. I will note that this lesson uses the cool Jewish woman from the site. So if we go back to the homepage, um, we have uh, articles about these women. So they're not primary sources except for the photographs, um, but it would be really easy to put together some primary sources of different women, find primary sources from some of these women, newspaper articles about them or, um, things that they've written um, and, and other women and men also that uh, highlight some of the values or ideas that you're trying to get across. And then I'm just gonna switch to the PowerPoint to show you. So what we did in this lesson is we first asked the students, we came up with a list of Jewish values um, and we asked the students to pick a few, one or two that were particularly important to them and do some writing on the back of these cards. Sorry, I should go full screen. Um, do some writing on the back of these cards about um, what that particular value meant to them. And then what they did is they went around the room and read these biographies and looked at the pictures of the different women that we have profiled and decided which ones exemplified the values that they were holding in their hands. Um, and what was great about this is it also led to some debate of whether or not a certain woman really exemplified a given value. And some of the kids felt confused, like they had a, a value and they weren't really sure where it went. And in that case, it opened up the discussion to say, well, does anyone have an idea of who exemplifies this value from the biographies that you read? And asking students to sort of make a statement of who they thought that was and then back it up by explaining why was a really great way to bring especially younger kids into this conversation about how does who we are inform what we do and how does what we do in the world say something about who we are and what's important to us. Um, I also think that sometimes with students a challenge is help understanding what is Jewish about Jewish values and, and, and especially when we're talking about things like tzedakah which, or about um, more general things like some of the ones that are listed here, equality or speaking up um, we have Jewish lenses through which to view those values, but in, in a certain way, they're human values. So giving some examples, especially in the context of Jewish, um, people or events that are tied closely to Jewish history is a really great way to sort of make that connection more explicit for students. Um, so that brings us to the end, except that I will reiterate what I already said about the Natalia Torsky Educator Award. Um, so we extended, the deadline was originally uh, at the end of, at the beginning of this year, January 3rd, but we extended that deadline through um, the middle of May so that more people could use this semester to explore how they might bring these lessons in. So many educators reached out to us and said, hey, it would be really great to have the spring semester um, it's where we get to modern history. It's also a, a, a lot of us teach classes two times. So this is a second chance to do the lesson. So um, I really hope that some of you will apply and tell your colleagues 
um, about this award. It's a really fantastic opportunity. Again, the, the prize is $2,500 for the winning educator or educator. So if you are working with a uh, if you're team teaching, you can apply together and share the prize. And you also get $500 for your school to put towards um, gender inclusive programming and programming about uh, Jewish history. So um, I really hope that you'll consider applying. All the information is online at jwa.org slash Torsky. Um, and you can also email us at any time. I'm putting my email address in the chat window now. Um, but if you just email education at jwa.org with any questions that you have or um, sources that you're looking for, we're always happy to help you and be of service in any way that we can as you're doing this very important work.